Let's see. How do I add? Hey everyone, we're going live. I just invited Demetrius on. Um, Hey. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Kriyan, Bari, Pinchef, La Flor, Fugitiva, Targol. Hey, really excited to be here. Me too. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this is going to be our live discussion with Demetrius of um, Black Socialists in America. Of America. We're really excited to, to come together. We have some points that we want to share with you all. Well, we want to bring up with each other so that we can talk about them and then we can share how we think and feel. And we're so eager to also hear from you all. That's kind of the point why, of course, this is live as to how it is that you're, you're feeling right now. What it is that you're thinking and if you'd like i invite you to put it in the chat um if you have anything that you'd like uh, for us to touch on what this live discussion is going to be about is it's called prefiguring hope in a time of collapse and so what prefigurative means is figuring it now like creating it now rather than waiting for after the revolution that the prefiguration of that other world that we want is right now so um that's what we mean by prefiguring and we're also needing to talk about hope because it's a time of collapse as well which is something that isn't discussed in the seriousness that it should be um because a lot of the time capitalism is left out of the discussion and so when we talk about climate collapse and extinction, the above, you know, the dominant institutions of empire, the way that they talk about collapse is, is as a, a problem of overpopulation, not a problem of capital, which then of course, from their perspective means that it's other people that are the problem, not systems. And so what we see is an attitude toward the below, toward those who are not in the rich countries, those without a lot of power above, their lives are understood as disposable. And this is, of course, really relevant to what we're all witnessing with Palestine, with Israel, and not just Israel, it's also the United States, and it's not just also the United States, it's also many other European countries, former so so-called former colonial powers so hey demetrius is on let's go let's see how this works this is my the first time i'm doing a live with somebody else let's see hey, hey how we going just trying to set set my freaking camera up right <laughs> <laughs> How, how are you? I'm all right. You know, I was just while we were waiting, just talking about the title of our talk, of this discussion that, of course, mm -hmm. we invite everyone to join us in. And the title is Prefiguring Hope in a Time of Collapse. Yeah. And I wonder, what are, your, what are your feelings about that title, Demetrius, that you and I came up with? <laughs> what is it that, that you liked about it? Um, I think for me yeah i mean it really kind of unites the sort of um in my personal opinion the 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 practical along with the sort of um spiritual and psychological um that yeah there's this sort of feeling this sort of um feeling of despair and hopelessness that um, I feel like every 
everyone is feeling due to all of these sort of global crises, be it, you know, authoritarianism, the climate, of course, the, the, the genocide. So, I, yeah, I think it's really a really interesting title because it's like, well, we hope isn't something that you just have to simply wait on. It's something that you can construct and actively construct and build. And that's not something that you do alone. It's something that you do in community. Mm -hmm. um, um, and that really speaks to the sort of feelings of loneliness and isolation that are becoming more and more prevalent in our in our society. So that that's that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, and um, something that I think a lot about our encounter. So Demetrius mm -hmm. and I met in Detroit this past summer. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that what was missing in a lot of the conversation was about prefiguring that other world that we want right now. Right. And how it is that we do that. And so I think a lot about, at this time, I, I think often about the teachings of our elders. Right. And the Zapatistas for a lot of us are our elders. And what they've been talking about in recent months is keeping it a focus on the material basis for struggle in as much as it's yeah. also spiritual and psychological and discursive. They're very famous for having gone from the fire to the word or from the weapon to the, to the, the discourse mm -hmm. that communicates. Understanding that, that those are powerful weapons. There has to be though a material basis that makes it so that we can be autonomous from capitalism, which is this beast that is destroying the world, destroying even life on the, on the planet. And so many of us are anti-capitalist and something that I personally learned in Zapatista territory, while in Zapatista territory being hosted during their little school for a few days in a village, is that, you know, they were feeding me, they were giving me all my water, my shelter, my bathroom, my shower. And I realized I didn't know how to live without capitalism. Right. right. You know, that I was so anti-capitalist, but how was I going to live without capitalism? Right. And that is right. the hard part. Right. Right. And what I, I, I've been thinking about this more in terms of sort of like um, anarchistic and left libertarian politics, because, you know, once and, and also anti-capitalist politics, but it's like we don't really think about the level of dependency that we have on these various systems that are, you know, we use to care for ourselves in, 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 in certain ways, but also are ultimately under undermining the very conditions for us to even be able to care for ourselves to begin with. And with in regards to like a sort of anarchistic politics, left libertarian politics, anti-capitalist politics, what it's calling you towards is a sort of ethic and politics of responsibility, right? Because when you no longer have these power structures, these um, destructive, demonic, toxic power structures, um, you know, uh, utilizing them to meet your needs like now you have to do that for yourself now you're going into a new level and a new a new space of self-sufficiency mm -hmm. and yeah it's 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 really jarring when you have have it lay, have it put in front of your face like that you know like i can't do without these particular creature comforts I've, I've, I've been conditioned and socialized into that and here these people are making do with what they have mm -hmm. right I, I don't have the cape you you know you, you're confronted with that i don't have the capability to do that for for myself mm -hmm. it's terrifying. so it's, it's terrifying and i think for those of us who have started to engage with our our comrades and our family that are survivalists and that care about preparedness. And once they really start 
detailing out, out for you all, all of the systemic and structural and institutional and infrastructural weaknesses that we are all vulnerable to, you know, that, that, that's for, what for me was a wake up call. Right. Um, especially being from Texas here in Texas, um, when we had the freeze, um, and hundreds of people died, right. It was underreported for a while. Um, especially by Texas officials and authorities and stuff like that. Hundreds of people died and we were, and no one was coming to save us, you know, how everyone made fun of Ted Cruz for leaving him, his, him, his family leaving. They actually live in a, this, this, um, very like upper class wealthy area here, here in uh, Houston, uh, called River Oaks, where all the rich, rich, predominantly white folks live. But yeah, they, they left, they left, they went off to, I think Hawaii or some, some sort of, some sort of, um, tropical place or whatever while we were here such as myself freezing in my bed under multiple layers multiple clothes on still freezing you know people's pipes busted people having issues with water issues with food your refrigerator isn't working like the act you know like like the thing that the the, the daily day-to-day -day things that you need to survive are not here for you and the state is, is not coming they can't come. The state is not coming. Okay. Okay. So we understand that no one is coming to save us. We have to save us. That's right. Okay. So what does that look like practically to start saving ourselves? What does that look like? What does it look like? Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it really does come down to... I mean, and I call it terrifying because I started to map in my mind every single thing that I need in order to just exist. And of course, water, clean water is number one. Yeah. And clean soil, clean water and clean soil, right? And so many of us who are encountering our, uh, each other in spaces as we do, like in Detroit or here, you know, are very urban. Mm -hmm. And we're urban not from by choice we were pushed out off of our lands taken from yeah. our lands had lands taken from us right yes. and so then we eventually then go to the city which is the story of so much of the globe more than 50 percent of the global population now is urban meaning that they've yes. been pushed off of land yeah. and might yeah. it's the cities in order to articulate with money in order to have money to then buy everything that we need in order to live, even just to stay alive. That's how embedded we are in these capitalist circuits. And, you know, we're here, if we can just talk about the context we find ourselves in on, on this platform, this corporate platform, Yeah. through these corporate devices. Right. That, that for a lot of us, and, uh, and especially with the pandemic, uh, a lot a lot of folks found a lot of solace in these parasocial relationships online because mm -hmm. it, it was easier to find people, I guess, that way that 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 vibe with yeah. you, vibe with your yeah. energy. And, and of course, with Palestine, that so many in real life relationships have fractured irreparably and a yeah. lot of hearts have been broken in real life. These devices are kind of like this, they're a tool that a lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of us are, are, are leaning to maybe cuddled up in the fetal position, watching this horror live streaming. Right. And then mm -hmm. also finding your people and then the mind fuck that you then learn about the Congo. Right. And, and what is fueling this device? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. blood fuel, yes. you know, that like we need to go to all of those contradictions i feel like in order to really get to the heart of yes. what is wrong yes. and instead what i'm seeing on the same social media as i've been studying the way that social media carries the narrative of palestine and the zapatistas in recent months especially palestine and what what is out there is a lot of really important news reporting 
absolutely sadly a lot of that then leads to indoctrination into a certain position and not into critical education so that we could all try to figure this out for ourselves so there's this replication of these logics that we're trying to fight against they, they become replicated within yeah. our own minds, you know with these right. figures that become figures on the premise on the basic assumption that they are needed and so they must remain uh, as some a figure that is needed rather than someone who is trying to make themselves no longer needed which is like the more like the ella baker philosophy of organizing that strong right. people don't need strong leaders yeah right and yeah. instead what we're seeing replicated over and over again and this seems to be a time where so many of this con of these contradictions are coming out into the open i think this is a, a time where we need to have conversations that go all of the way that that address every contradiction and if we can't begin with the congo we're going to miss the real root the a real radical root of this world that's killing so much of us so many of us so much of life absolutely yeah and let's 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 address some of that bit by bit i mean I think to go to the sort of, um, oh, there's so much, yeah, the sort of contradiction in terms of the Congo that the resource extraction, that the exploitation of the Congo, the, the Congolese people and the, the, that ecosystem is what allows us to have these uh, uh communication technologies that you and I are talking talking on and corresponding through um so that we can have these sort of discussions and the the, the all of these massive contradictions right of that exploitation of people the resource extraction but the fact that we are we have to engage in political education and have these sort of, uh, of of conversations and discourses and dialogues on liberatory and revolutionary ideas mediated through these corporate capitalist systems that i mean that's what instagram is we're on meta right mm -hmm. right Zuck Z zuckerberg's world mm -hmm. <laughs> that's 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 that that's what we're we're talking through it, mm -hmm. it's 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 insane so we are put into these sort of positions in which we have to use some of the elements of capitalism to fight against capitalism. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, you know, he's unfortunately disgraced now, but a good point that Noam Chomsky has, has brought up when people have questioned him about his employment with MIT. And he brings up the fact that Marx himself Marx studied in the British Museum, which essentially is an institution completely forged and built off of settler colonialism all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. But he, mm -hmm. he, but Marx was able to use that those books, that knowledge that was accessible there, in order to develop um, a, a revolutionary analysis and you know strategy and tactics, you know, and and of course, I mean, we, you know. Um, those of us who do have more uh, anarchistic and left libertarian leanings have our critiques of Marx, you know, of, as as we should, as we should. No one is a guy. We don't deify anybody here. But, um, but yeah, we, 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 having to face that contradiction of like, yeah, having to use certain certain elements and sort of certain aspects of capitalism and weaponize it against capitalism itself, or even having to do that in in regards to the state just in general with any of these systems of subjugation or exploitation. Mm -hmm. So that is really, you know, difficult to, to, to grapple with. And, you know, people doing so much engaging around Congo, Sudan, and Palestine through, through these very systems. It is, it is very much a, 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 a mind fuck. I mean, it, it, it it really is the, the trying to grapple with these contradictions but i think that brings us to another point in terms of prefiguration and building the new world 
than the shell of the old because we're not just talking about again bringing it back to the material to the concrete to the practical that also is connected to the sort of technology that we have like how can we develop liberatory technologies how can we develop technologies that center healthy social relations healthy human relations how do we think about how do how do we develop technology and tools that are not or or or, or at least to the to the um, that are, that are far less destructive to the ecology how do we, mm-hmm. we do that practically how do we do that right yep. um and that's the beginning of self-sufficiency and maybe to go even deeper into what prefiguration even is yeah. right which one of my favorite uh, um definitions of prefiguration is come is coming from a book called pre uh, prefigurative politics i cannot I, I i cannot remember the authors the author's names um i'll have to give it to you kiki so that you can put it in the show notes but it is a fantastic um overview in um of prefigurative politics um in in all of its aspects it's it's phenomenal but what is prefiguration prefiguration is essentially us beginning to embody in the here and now the future social relations that we want right so we want more democracy specifically direct democracy we want more kindness more compassion um co- uh, 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 collaboration creativity um, to be more cooperative and collaborative. We have to start embodying those things right now within our social movements, within the alternative systems and institutions that we are developing, be it a, a, a fucking union, um, a cooperative, whatever it is, right? We have to start acting in the now as we want to be in the future, right? That's right. And we have to start building in the now the the institutions and systems that we want in the future systems that can actually meet our needs and systems and structures and institutions and ways of living and being that are are, um that have a healthy symbiotic relationship with the net with the non-human natural world right so you know, I'm sorry. I've, I'm always going to try to try to take it to the practical and and and, and the concrete, and um, that's what prefiguration is, and that is for me connected to the strategy of dual power, which is mm-hmm. essentially creating institutions. It's essentially this idea that there are two powers, right? That that, that one power is a power of the working class and the poor. They have uh, created these institutions for themselves that are in conflict and at tension with the powers of the ruling elite, white supremacy, capitalism, so on and so forth, right? Mm-hmm. And but yeah, how do we how do we engage in this strategy? How do we get into that? to that scenario of dual power, mm-hmm. right? Which is connected to prefiguration. And what and what does all of that look like physically, right? And we've been having, and, and it, this is what I wanted to invite you to, Kiki, to speak more on. I know that you and some of your comrades are engaged in actual land projects, right? And these, uh, the we've been having more conversations around eco-villages, eco-communities, and so on and so forth. So I, I just wanted to ask, you know, what has been your experience and your journey with with doing the work practically on the you know getting the land building up the land so on and so forth yeah that that encompasses so much of what you're talking about strategy and tactics is what comes to mind in terms of these two worlds this dual power is when i think about dual power i think about competing worlds competing ways of being right. not another power that wants to only make the dominant one irrelevant so that it can then become just like the dominant one, but with right. a different place, yes. right? 
it, it's really the logic and the practice that 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 dual power is looking for the way that we use it, I believe it, is that we're looking for a different way of doing. So one that it doesn't dominate. It's not this, you know, hierarchical above, below, haves and have nots, people who make their lives at the expense of others, right? And right. at the material level and also at the psychological level, just sizing each other up every time, you know, we meet a new person, a stranger, like the superior, inferior ranking. That right. is the dominant world. And if we're gonna build a dual power to make this one irrelevant, then it needs to have a different logic and a practice. And how you were talking about with land, for example, undoing this human is superior to the nature relationship or land relationship, right? right. So a more side-by-side -side would understand that humans are part of nature. We are different and we are also interconnected to it. So we're not separate. Exactly. So this interconnectivity, right? Yes. Whereas the dominant world begins with the individual, this is liberalism and capitalist philosophy, the, the self-made person, the eco, uh, homo economicus, the what you know, the, that if you just follow your own personal um, well-being or, or desires, that it will be f great for everybody. So that that world of the individual centered in that way. If we're going to create another world that's different then we need to start with interconnectivity yeah. right and and also realizing it's about a collective about a, a common but it's not about sameness which is i think what a lot of people think about when they think about communism or communalism in the reactionary way under the third world war the so-called cold war we had this discourse of the ussr and the so and um nato where this USSR's world, the second world, was about state communism. It's more like state capitalism, mm -hmm. but that, that version of state communism was about everybody living the same, everybody being the same, having the same. Right. Whereas with NATO and the world of capital, that one always promoted itself as individual freedom. And the thing is, is that we're stuck then in these binaries if we don't understand that there's also a way of being an individual that is interconnected to a community at the same time. And that if we can get to an assumption where we are equal because we're different, rather, yes. than, rather than we're equal once we meet a certain standard. Unity and diversity. Exactly. Unity and diversity. Yes. Which is, which is an ecological logic and principle right. when you look at the natural world all of it different but all of it interconnected like you were saying exactly just just didn't put you off the natural world there are our greatest ancestors we just observe them though you know the way that life works in the natural world that we're also a part of so so with that framework of you know having it be as clear as it can be in in an abstract way that's a, a common framework because what it looks like on the ground is going to be very, very contextual and very different but if we can have a common framework of how we want to have power circulating and how we want to relate to the other with an ethics an ethics of a very ancient practice of the I am we, or the in Lakesh, right? You are my other me, that interconnectivity. Then it makes it easier to then do the work on the ground with a guide. More con concretely, what we're, ex what we're doing here in the LA area and the surrounding mountains, it's occupied Tongva, Ketanamuk, and Shumash land. We have different land projects going. Um, in different formations, and one of them is a community land trust, a, a nonprofit that took us a lot of debate to even have to create because of all of the problems with the nonprofit industrial complex. Yes. You know, and so, so the way that we have we relate to the community land trust is the community land trust was created by movements on the ground. And one of those movements was a squatters movement is a squatters movement, the re reclaimers that a lot of the world learned about during the pandemic in 2020. And the land trust is there to help us knock out all of our landlords. So it's a very specific task. We want to knock out our landlords. Yes. And not only that, we want to also 
develop a culture and a practice along with the logic of removing the tenant landlord above and below the landlord yes. tenant above and below where it's all of us who uh, are no, no longer have a landlord how are we going to care for the land how are we and the buildings and you know the open space the housing we have housing open space and we're trying to get a storefront for a cooperative grocery store from neighboring farms and stuff so we're trying to create these other 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 webs more ethical webs of relating while also trying to figure out how do we navigate these two worlds of autonomy and this bourgeois institution called the 501c3 and how do we make it so that even and if the state decides to take away our 501c3 or because the state this this is always the danger of working within the state is that it can take it away whatever it is that you're working on uh which happened in mexico with the common lands that were institutionalized with the mexican revolution and then with the zapatista uprising in 1994 it was the removal of the common lands so that the state can give the state can take away so then how do we preserve that way of relating in terms of a common that is horizontal that self manages self governs as a community when the when the institution is no longer around and this is what's important in terms of strategy and tactics strategy being our plan for what for our goal our goal is to defend life to be free So what's our strategy toward that? And our strategy is building autonomy, which is this dual power with a material basis. It's not just at the discursive level. It's not just words. We're putting it into practice because it's those practices that are the root, the the core of that prefiguration. How we're treating each other? Are we how are we treating each other is really the question. So then we have to navigate how we then use these tactics at hand and these tactics are tools or methods that can be discarded or not as long as yes. they're advancing the strategy it's great but once they stop advancing the strategy and are even hindering it yes. then they need to be discarded yes. right and if they can't yes. be discarded then the strategy isn't strong enough it looks like you've gotten caught up or we've gotten caught up in the currents of the dominant world right so right. keeping those separate and also diversifying the ways that we do things because We also have a, a land liberation project that doesn't articulate with the 501c3. It articulates sadly with just regular property law. But we don't want to be property owners. We don't consider land as property. Uh and what the way that that exists is several of us uh um having have the person with the best credit take out the mortgage and it's just radical trust that we put into this project. uh um, as we're trying to materially like build shelter build a uh, food source food forest also you know have water and all of this of course is with um a very specific context of we see how this country is going it's really like if we read the way that this country is going and how the masks are just coming off and coming off and coming off yes they're not not come they're not going to be there for us and those of us who live in cities and most of us on the left or cons- who consider themselves leftists live in cities it is terrifying to think of what it takes to run a city and how fragile yeah. it is right so what we were talking about with the with our prepper fam <laughs> like they can they can spot every weakness right it is yes. terrifying and so then how we also need to answer to this question of how do we have an ethical relationship to the countryside between countryside and city because like to create los angeles yes. for example it's a crime it's a crime how los angeles has yeah. been created through the destruction of so much other life most major cities if not all yeah. major cities are just yeah. human and ecological Absolutely. nightmares you know Absolutely yeah and then imagine a nightmare of a crisis hitting here in LA we could all be penned in easily yes really like this by just the closure of the freeways yes. unless we have off-roading vehicles all of that right and imagine yeah. just the freeway situation on a regular day like not all the cars are going to fit as people are trying to you know any kind of crisis like this it's really so what we're trying to do is really try to go down to those contradictions 
with a real life practice yes. where we're coming up across institutions that we're trying to figure out how to use rather than have them use mm -hmm. us and and how do we make the how what do we know is the proof of that or the truth of our movement right and it's going to be really in the end how it is that we feel do we feel safe with each other do we feel like we trust each other do we feel like we're each other's true like ride or dies in the storm because we're facing a storm yeah and how are we going to get to the other side of this storm yeah yeah and i think part of what we're articulating here is understanding social revolution as holistic systems change that centers that for human beings centers our needs and social relations like how are we treating one another how are we engaging with with one another how are we engaging with um uh the natural the non-human natural world and the ecology and also i think another conversation that we need to be having a lot more is how are we engaging with non-human animals right having a, a larger conversation about um animal liberation and how that's connected to human liberation and 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 um and the ecology as a whole and i think that there are a lot it, it, particularly when it comes to animal liberation you know i mean i even and think that the so-called left and, and, and liberationists and revolutionaries are very much still captured by the sort of um, denigration of, of, of vegans and, and, and vegetarians and so on and so forth. But we do need to have mm -hmm. those sorts of conversations because, again, it's about being holistic and it's about life and, you know, how do we live lives of greater connection and so on and so forth um but yeah that's what we're talking about social revolution as as systems change mm -hmm. that centers needs and centers social relations and we need a, a strategy and or strategies of essentially mass divestment from these status quo systems towards healthy holistic needs meeting systems and what does that look like and it looks like you know what you and your com comrades are doing and yeah it, it part of it is that sort of contradiction like you were saying in having to engage with nonprofits and all, all the, these things in order to just have the resources to start building these autonomous um projects mm -hmm. and institutions and systems and, and, and such mm -hmm. um and yeah like we need to start doing that now and really internalizing an ethics and a politics of responsibility and and self-sustainability um but one that isn't like in the traditional sort of prepper way of like me and my family and my homestead this this hype still still rooted in hyper individualism no we're talking about a communal a communal effort and in a, in a, a communal project and yeah understanding that like you said the state isn't coming to save you understanding that a lot of the institutions and the systems and the infrastructure like you were saying with la and with a lot of these major cities are not guided by a logic of meeting human needs they're not guided by a logic of sustained ecological sustainability or harmony they're guided solely by the logic of capital okay. right mm -hmm. and and you can see that in its most extreme form and i know that the marxists and the communists the authoritarians are going to hate me for saying this but it's the truth look at the ghost cities in china where they build massive cities either complete or incomplete where no with no people in them and and, and count that and, and and it's counted as a part of their overall uh yield and productivity it's it's pure insanity it's a growthist logic it's an eco modernist logic that has to be done away with and we need to think about things such as degrowth seriously yeah. what is what does that look like you know you're just making me think about the that saying you know i think we all have heard by now that for many it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capital yes you know and it's i think i think our material reality on the so-called left as 
living a life that is so dependent on capital and we don't talk about it, it makes it so that becomes just a place you don't even go. Instead, what we're hearing, you know, from the so-called left is about um, a green new deal or some kind of new deal that is going to maintain lifestyles intact of the yes. West and just lower the carbon footprint, which then the answer becomes batteries. And then what fuels batteries is all the blood. Resource extraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I want, I want to speak to that because people have to understand the nature of the state of the nation state and of governments. You know, um, the scholar James C. Scott in his book, Seeing Like a State, which I highly recommend, he talks about the ideology of the state, this idea called high modernism, this idea that, you know, rationality and logic and um, technology used by the state can essentially, you know, sort of bring order over over human life and the natural world. And but but the problem is that the ideology of, of high modernism doesn't understand unity and diversity. It doesn't understand interconnectivity. It doesn't understand that the, the, the need for diversity and it tries to contain and, and capture all of that through what he calls uh, making it, by, by making it legible, mm -hmm. by, simple, by trying to simplify and reduce down. It's, 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 it's an extreme act of reductionism by trying to simplify and reduce down all of this diversity, all of this complexity, all of this nuance that exists in, in, in human life, in the natural world, in order to contain it, in order to quantify it. This is why we have last names. This is why we have units of measure. This and, and um, you would know as, as, a, as a geographer, this is why we have the sort of forms of geography that we have, because the state has to keep its eye on everything, has to quantify everything, right? It can't deal with, for example, when we're talking about ethnicity, it cannot deal with the complexities of ethnicity and nationhood and peoplehood and, 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 and identity. It can't deal with that. So, so all, all, all of these people, these are the blacks. <laughs> these are the blacks here are the browns here are the the asians no 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 there's no understanding of any of any of that complexity at all in any of that what, what what does that mean black doesn't describe anything in africa and brown don't describe anything in in uh uh, uh you know so-called south america so-called latin america doesn't describe I mean, it, it, you know, so, but that's the nature of the state. That's what it does. It's trying to contain and 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 quantify and cage all of this this dynamism, this complexity, this nuance, and it's not going to work. Uh, it uh, the the projects that come out of that ideology of high modernism from the state will always fail. Me, which means for us practically. The state is not the state again. The state is not coming. They're not coming when when all when, when all of the foundations fall apart. The state isn't coming. No. You know, and, and, it's not. And oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no, and so really internalizing that, really beginning to, and, and educating ourselves on what the nation state is, what government is, its true nature, how it actually functions, how it actually operates, what are the ideologies, the philosophies, the belief systems, the, the logics, the social logics that, that propel the state. Uh, it's the same with capitalism, right? Really, really understanding these things and trying to act against them. And I think another thing that has to be understood on a sort of meta level is that, you know, the, the, and, and I'm kind of getting into ideas that people like David Graeber, he has an essay, um, in order to save the world, we have to stop working. Or, you know, people like John Holloway, his book, Crack Capitalism, understanding that we, through our labor, through our very life activity, are creating these systems of subjugation and domination by engaging in them. Mm -hmm. You know, really, really internalizing that and, and, and understanding that. And so, again, that's why I talk about, you know, we're, we're produ 
producing and reproducing these systems over and over and over and over again through our labor. So how so so again, how do we create a process and a strategy of mass divestment that takes our time, our energy, our attention, our activity, our labor, not work? What we're doing now under capitalism is work, labor is different than work. How do we take all of that and and put it into and start developing alternative systems that actually meets our needs, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think that's what that's what we that's what really has to be internalized here is that we're creating capitalism through our through our activity and our actions. Right. And it's hard to get it out of that. It's hard to get out of it, like you're saying. At certain at a many points you're gonna have to engage with it. You know mm -hmm. even even when we talk about, you know, things like mutual aid and trying to do for ourselves and stuff like that for our communities, like it part of the hard reality is that there are certain mechanisms and institutions of the state that we could use now and leverage now to to meet people's needs where they're where, where they're at but we don't want to remain there because we know we know where it's headed we know where it's headed we know we're fearing a trump presidency specifically his insane psychotic project of dictatorial rule project 2025 you know i'm, yeah. I'm here in texas and if, if you've been paying attention to the news in texas the standoff between border patrol and the national guard we're actively seeing the splintering of the state internally we're actively seeing that yes, right we we're actively seeing it before you know? our eyes before our very eyes so what are we going to do? <laughs> what, are, what are we going to, what practically, what are we going to do? Where, where you are, where you're at, where are you going to do? And I think part of my frustration has been with some of the engagement with Palestine is when you look at the, 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 or, the activist and organizer culture in the United States, it's very much a, a, a problem of the tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. So we are doing all of this organizing, all of this activism, whatever you want to call it, on all of these various issues and struggles in our communities. But then one particular issue, one particular global event, you know, either international or national event comes along, it achieves a certain level of virality, and then we all chase that. Mm. Right. Yeah. So you're not focusing on your abortion work anymore like that. You're not focusing on your 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 um abolitionist work like that mm -hmm. anymore. Now now it's the well we uh, we got to make a statement on Palestine. We got to do some about Palestine. And I'm not saying that people should be silent. They shouldn't be. But you also you also have to continue to do that work where you were at in in your community where you are now. And it's like you said, it, it does become this voyeuristic practice of the, on on the phone that's that's developed through Congo exploitation, staring into the into the black mirror like the TV show, into the black mirror, just eating up some of the worst indignities that human beings. I I I, I can't even put words to to seeing children butchered by the state i can't i can't even i don't even you know that's what we're watching on a daily basis and it is viral because like yeah this might be one of the first genocides if not the first genocide in human history that we all have a front row seat to through through these phones yeah. it, it achieve yeah it, it achieves i'm seeing people in the comments say yeah we're we're, we're reactive we're reactive and somebody said we're well-trained consumers yes yes that's that's what that is mm -hmm. so you can speak on palestine and we must speak on palestine we must speak on congo we must speak on sudan but at the same time continue that abolitionist work continue that work in terms of of of, of when it comes to abortion and 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 uh reproductive justice con con Continue fighting for the liberation of our trans family and our queer family. Yes. You know, so it's it's 
holding all of these things um, together. And, and that's my problem with this, this organizing culture. You know, we're going to need hands everywhere because there's needs all over the place. But it, it can't just stop there. It has to be like, again, again that project of mass divestment. Mm -hmm. And this, our everyday lives. Absolutely. And having that sort of, in, having a militant mindset and also releasing within yourself, mentally and spiritually, releasing attachment to, to this. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to be working your full time job very soon in the future. That's not going to be happening. When the state buckles and collapse, which means the economy will buckle and collapse. Have you have 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 you and your community prepared yourself wherever you're at for what's coming? At the very least, to not freak out because that yes. panic, right? Have, yes, have, we got to have these conversations. Have we had these conversations now? We really need to, you know, talk about what's really happening at the and it's hard. I love the way that you point out the ways, I mean, the different ways of power. And I think that that might be connected to um, that activist culture, which which feels like consumerist culture too, the way that, you know, every struggle is forced under a capitalist consumerist culture to market mm -hmm. itself as the most important. Yes. Because everyone's you know the way that it's handled is is that as if they're all in isolation and that you need to learn you got to get a phd you got to get like a you got to be an expert to even say anything right yes Rather than being able to e see something like see the congo see sudan and immediately you can understand holy shit this is part of this bigger this is what the war looks like there in this context, yes context right this bigger war that we're all in rather rather than just wars <laughs> yes there are wars there's a bigger war there's, I, I love so much the zapatistas fourth world war theorization that a lot of us have been uh theorizing together with them for decades since the 90s and after 9 11 that documentary the fourth world war came out that talked that put it in put their theorization into conversation with the war on terror after 9 11. And so they talk about how with the Third World War, which people call the Cold War, because it was cold between the Europeans, but it wasn't cold in Africa, Asia, Central America, that that was a war between states and it was a war supposedly between state communism and capitalism, free market capitalism. With the 90s, and I remember a coming of age as a, as a as an adult in the 90s and hearing this term globalization and what that really meant was yeah, the whole world is going to have capitalism now yeah that's the fourth world war it's capital versus mm -hmm. anything that gets in, in its way and anything, yeah. including us yes yes all all, all life all life, <laughs> all life is, is commodified that's right exactly and so then we need to think about power as not just violent power there's other modes of power and if we're contributing to capital we're contributing our power our exercises of exercises of power are reinforcing capital because yes. we keep engaging in it we keep asking it for things we want yes. it to be <laughs> yes yes and that's and that's um part of the illusion right the sort of cognitive error the sort of co cognitive or bias, uh, the philosopher David Hume talked about it. I, I can't remember the, the specific name for it, but it's this sort of assumption that, that we make that tomorrow or the future will be the same as the present and the past, right? And this is this is something that that philosopher. I can, I can if there's any philosophy nerds, please post what that concept is. I forgot what it's called. But yeah, we make that sort of assumption, that fallacious assumption of stability. And, yep. and if we're actually, you know, being scientific thinkers and, and 
empirical thinkers and really observing what's happening around us no like it's not it's not going to be it's not going to be this the future is not going to be the same as it is now we're not going to have those creature comforts right and and i think part of the problem of getting people to believe in stability and in in order this is something that cedric robinson talks about his book the terms of order like leadership political leadership fools you into thinking that there's a stable political order you know and that's deeply internalized like what you said about experts right well I'll, well i can't speak on anything because i'm not an expert and of course we don't want to encourage a sort of culture of like idle chatter where people haven't study or taken in wisdom in any way that they can and then just just give out their opinions that's dangerous right that's what we saw with the with the covid denialism the anti-vax nonsense um and so we we do want people to do the work of political education self-education but at the same time let go of that sort of internalized inferiority and and um subordination in your mind because the whole expert thing it can become an issue of, of a leadership like i still need a savior and leader to articulate these ideas that i have in, have in my head you know and um yeah sadly a lot, a lot of leaders or folks who are self-appointed because we have leaders whether we pick them or not it's the ones taking the lead right and a lot of the leaders out there sadly they want want to be that person that tells people what to do like that to me is ter a terrifying position imagine being someone that <laughs> is in charge of telling everybody what to do like you the, the the impossibility of that in an ethical way because context is different in every instant and those who know who those who have to live with the consequences of whatever decision shouldn't shouldn't those be the ones making the decisions those having mm -hmm. to face consequences right right because then you'll right but you'll make the decision that leads to the consequence that you can live with right right you got to really think that through and there's a lot of power in that and these are these are practices that are so ancient and are ancestral to all of us and how it was that we even got to 200,000 or more years as just homo sapiens yeah as a species right is is, is this figuring things out out without these institutions the way that modernity likes to come in or europe modern europe likes to come in is to just act as if just because they were in the dark ages <laughs> that everybody was in the dark ages and that europe had to come along and show everybody how to grow food <laughs> how to you know find clean water those kinds of things that were completely unnecessary because we had already ancestrally we have already figured so much of this out including questions of justice which is the 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 point that is the hardest for movements in in a prefigurative mode of building communal autonomy a lot of us find this as the challenge it's also the great opportunity and i'll just share a story about this in france when the zapatistas went to europe in 2021 and visited the europe from below yeah, yeah. which was like a conceptual healing for a lot of us like oh shit, yeah there is you're right <laughs> right right we, we, we don't want to write off all of our all of our european no. family we 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 not gonna do that no it's easy to it's easy to <laughs> i know that i know <laughs> um it was so healing conceptually in that way and then being at the zad which is a an autonomous like zone for defense that french the uh, french compas from below which is also weird to say by the way french compas and british compas like we kind of chuckle at yeah. that you know because it's but no french compas uh who are holding down the zad against the, the building of a tourist airport it's france's second largest airport and they have succeeded for now in doing that by mobilizing a lot of folks and they have their own food growing there they have so much land they have shelter they have their education but they said that they have all of that they have a material basis but they haven't been able to figure out the community justice question mm. and that to me kind of gave, gave me hope in the horror 
because community justice questions are questions we can all uh, engage with now, whether we have liberated land or not, because yes. it's questions about how we treat each other. Yes, yes, the, the social relations piece. And I think to, to speak to some of that, and, and I, I see some really good comments here, I just wanted to read. Um, but I think, I think it's important for people to understand the distinction between like power and exploitation. Right, that the anti-capitalist movement is about ending exploitation. But the issue of power is has been a perennial universal issue for human beings since we've emerged in on on this world, right? And so that's what that's what I love about anarchist thought is that it goes straight to that. Mm. It, it deals with hierarchy, you know, as the in Neo Zapatismo, the 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 above and the below, mm -hmm. left and right you know, a hierarchy, power, you know, uh, sorry, hierarchy, authority, coercion, domination, subjugation on all levels, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about power. And, and people have to understand that people can, people can engage in subjugation and subordination for reasons that are not purely material. There can people can engage in in, in, in in those sorts of things to satisfy an internal um to, to get a sort of internal satisfaction, a psychological and spiritual satisfaction, mm -hmm. right? Um and that's been part of my frustration too with some of the ways in which the the struggle in Palestine is framed right there are the, I'm talking about class reductionism right where you have the class reductionists left who see oh well Netanyahu is trying to build this on top of Palestine so on and so forth all all of which is true they, they, you can yes yes there is an exploitative element but there's still the element of power we're talking about culture ethnicity a uh, religion this is this is a religious war as well people people do not want to concede to that right the, uh, some of our family our leftist family who are deeply secular deeply materialist deeply atheistic and that's fine i respect that i'm not but so on and so forth, it doesn't matter. But you have to understand that there are internal things, things outside of just material things that lead people to dominate one another. You have to understand that. And Palestine is situated within, and, and, and our, our uh, beloved comrade, um, uh, Mohammed Abdo, uh, Mohammed really articulates this well in, in, in the way he talks about Palestine, that, that Palestine is situated within a global war, a global sort of persecutory war against um, Muslims from below. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the Uyghurs in China. We're talk talking about what happened in Burma, the Rohingya. We're talking about what we do here in the United States. We're talking about the nonsense in France banning hijab all ty all types of stuff right we have we have to understand that we have to understand that that people it's not just a matter of just resources and physical things right that to me is a sort of deeply internalized capitalist mindset cuz that's what cap capitalism is mat is deeply material materialistic ruthlessly materialistic ruthlessly cares about the physical and the concrete and the tangible that's all it gives a fuck about it doesn't care about the psychological the spiritual there's no holistic understanding and we have to have a holistic understanding regardless of whatever your beliefs is beliefs are excuse me we have to have that right and i just i just wanted to say that but um some of the comments here like one of the comments how do we convince other people that the future will be so different and i think for me, it's like we have to start exercising our tool, our muscles of imagination now. So what? So that could be things like actual specific, 
specific exercises to help you visualize the future or um you know engaging with fiction right mm -hmm. and i think what i'm saying here is that we need to as communities how do we push people into pra into practices of creativity mm -hmm. right how do we how do we put ourselves and our communities into practices of creativity right in 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 a million and one different ways even even when you know when i'm in organizations and we're doing like a book study or something like that i always try to frame some of the questions that i'm asking in regards to the study in an imaginative fashion that will that will stretch us to really think about okay like what would a free future look like what, what would our anarcho-syndicalist utopia how would that function and how do we get there how will we get there right so little things that we can do to to engage the imagination um i think will be will be helpful but you know that's also a structural issue too when we look at the rights war on education and then wanting to ban particular books then wanting to ban the tony morrison the james baldwin so on and so forth these incredible wordsmiths that can really you know open up imaginative muscles so I, I don't know i'm curious uh, um kiki what, what, were you, what are your thoughts on that it's such a great question how you know how do we convince i think that's how it was framed yeah how do we convince other people that the future will be so different and i love the the spirit of convincing rather than defeating <laughs> into believing that i also think about though are we ourselves convinced you know, first, are we ourselves convinced? And also, if so, there's a lot of us who are convinced. I think a lot of us are meeting each other, finding each other more and more with Palestine. It, a lot of people have had their hearts broken, their worlds completely unveiled. Yeah. yeah. So, and actually, in doing awareness work on Palestine in the university context, and it was in a, a more elite university, which is... The, the, the more elite, the more problematic I've experienced in having real conversations about Palestine, like with the community college versus an Ivy League or another elite institution. Oh, in the, oh wow. Uh oh. In the more That's interesting, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why that is. <laughs> well, we spent wasted so much time trying to convince the audience Palestinians were human beings and that there weren't lies. So we always had to have a Jewish anti-Zionist and sometimes a white person, like as a neutral, to like, yes, they're all telling the truth kind of thing, everybody on stage, right? It, and, and then when I would come back home and just talk about it with the street, with our people, like immediately advanced conversations, you don't even have to start at the level that Palestinians are human. It's already people, all of us, like recognizing ourselves in that genocide and in that dispossession. So the far more advanced conversations about Palestine that I've experienced have happened from the below. Mm -hmm. And in ter terms of then convincing people, it is important to convince people, to convince our loved ones. I will also add that I also found that in those spaces where I didn't need to convince people, I was able to grow a lot more and we were able to do, we've always been able to do a lot more yeah. when we don't have to spend that kind of time trying to convince other people because it's also something that I learned time and time again. And I don't know if this, if others share this learnings, these learnings too, is that, you know, coming to this framework that I find really useful, the above below, very Fanonian and Zapatista. So it's Fanonian in that it points out the Manichaean dualism, the, the good versus evil, mm -hmm. the binary of mm -hmm. colonialism. And, and so like human, non-human is what we learn from Fanon, right? that Manichaean dualism of white and black. Yeah. And then with the Zapatistas, giving that a structural position of above, below, it, mm -hmm. it, rather than side by side, it shows how one's, one, the one above makes their lives off the backs of the below. So it's this. Yeah. A destructive relationship, exploitative, extractive as well. So 
that framework, I think, is so helpful to me in being able to read who I might be able to convince. Because, especially in conversations about Palestine, what I have experienced a lot is Zionists who are, are nice people. Everyone's nice people, right? Uh, at the end, they just say, well, isn't it just history that people have always subjugated others and taken over each other's lands? And now, and now they say that because they're above, right? But like when they're below, they don't say that. And when, when they're below, they want support, right? So some folks just seem to, I don't know if they really believe it or if that's just what they've been taught. I heard this from someone talking about Palestine from Lebanon last month or a couple months ago, they said, you know, I'm not upset that they want our stuff, the West. I'm not upset that they want our stuff. I'm upset that we can't defend it, mm. which then reinforces chauvinism. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yes. It's, it's, yes. it's the above below still. So some folks are really committed to that framework of above below. And I don't know if there's that much room for convincing if they're really committed to it if we've just been raised by it and then just like uh, showing a different possibility of relating could be that corrective, that conceptual healing. A lot, I mean, for me it was, for a lot of us it is, but I have come across some folks that just metaphysically, the convincing may not be possible because they truly believe in the dog eat dog kind yes. of world. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're still trapped in the um, competitive scarcity mindset and world worldview yeah absolutely there's another comment here that's really great and i think one for you also kiki and you um but this person says um this bell ux um i would like to mention how complex this continued dual power that dual power effort um becomes for immigrant folks who are here nor there as much as we have to detach and degrow we also need stability and belonging absolutely Absolutely. And, 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 you know, that's something that a contradiction that I think that a lot of David Graeber works bring brings up is that as we engage in care, the work of care, it forces us in a position of having to rely on the very systems that we're trying to abolish. Right. So it's a rough, it's, yeah, I mean, this, comment is great because it yeah that's that's a, a serious tension a serious contradiction and there's another um coming here folks are responding to how we can be spark people's imagination someone said work care craft oh i'm sorry well someone says work care, care craft commerce are older than capitalism absolutely and then some then uh, i believe the same person says practice governance together absolutely and they're asking uh Linda, can you riff on lessons from Abundant Table and LA Land Trust and your travels? I think you might have touched on on a, uh, that a little bit earlier. I love the I love both of these. I love all of these. The question on on the the migrant subject, especially undocumented, it's precarity, precarity and mm -hmm. dispossession, precarity after dispossession which is it's it's such a violence right that that is such a deep violence to have to leave your community and your lands like people here in the united states think people migrate here because everybody's jealous and everybody wants to be like the united states because so great hey, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i come from an undocumented community i was the kid that was born here so i was the citizen so that's that contrast is something that i've always grown up with like what my possibilities have been yeah and what my family's possibilities have been. And maybe it's also related to consciousness or empowerment. But what I have found in, in organizing, especially with undocumented migrants, whether they're day laborers or we're creating an assembly in the city um, as an autonomous politics and practice, we, the question of care and trust is really important because being in such a precarious position as not having papers or not really knowing this country well versus somebody like me who grew up understanding how this world, how this country functions and has papers, you see the difference in terms of maybe the risks that we can take. Right. Some of us can 
more risks than others, right? Mm -hmm. And I've and I've wondered for a long time: is it like I need a control group? I need to know: is this is is a radical consciousness always going to be a radical consciousness, no matter the context shift? And I've actually met Zapatistas who are no longer Zapatistas here working undocumented as field workers in California, but they don't. And I just know them because I knew them before in Mexico. I didn't like no one talks about it like that, that I've ever encountered or we were Zapatistas. Like when people who've been part of the Zapatista movement become migrants to the US or migrate anywhere. I mean, migrants come to be able to send money back. That's like the, the one task that's always been the task. Send right. money back home. And the the, the former Zapatistas that I've met who are no longer Zapatistas once they migrate, unless they have a very clear um, uh, organizational task in their migration on behalf of the Zapatistas, but when they come for themselves and for their family, then they no longer are Zapatistas. Like these are people with a very radical consciousness when they were Zapatistas and maybe they still have it, but the context shift of having to move to this really hostile geography people don't want to organize or they're afraid to organize because they have that one task yeah. of sending money back to their family right and that's something that we need to understand and it doesn't make them less lesser than anyone it's it's the context shift is really strong when we're coming from a context of war to a context of relative peace which is the u.s mm -hmm. border that's that mm -hmm. dividing line crossing that yeah. line so we do need to, you know, and we talked a bit, well, how could we do it, you know, because there was one compa out of like 30 who was down to organize, but he and I had had a personal relationship previously, and maybe that was why, because there was trust, but the others didn't really know us, and they had that one task, um, and I thought about like, like all of the complications in that, and 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 what kind of space we could make you know we were just talking about well maybe we could just you know talk about like a mentorship kind of way of like how do you build autonomy how do you deal with problems you know like all of the lessons there's so much wisdom from so many migrants in this country or anywhere anywhere all over the world there's wisdom and in this country specifically with migrants migrants are just treated as workers that's it like working in the fields and this is a lesson from the abundant table farm that I used to work at. Just being in that context, um, there we try to pull out the native wisdom of farm workers and notice that wow, just the contrast of how when they're over here cutting salary for these industrial farms, like nobody want the boss doesn't want to hear nothing about if you have a better way of cutting salary because that's not about a better way of doing it. it's a profitable way the more profitable yes. way, that's the only thing that you can contribute yes. to if a suggestion for that right so what gets lost a lot is these other knowledge knowledges of how we could be with the land um, like planting an entire milpa on a hillside that is some that that is some serious skill that doesn't get 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 talked about but it's something like if we're talking about trying to liberate land and create these land bases we're going to be confronted largely and like that's our case like in the mountains it's it's a lot of it is hillside you know a lot of it isn't this um or at least the stuff that's affordable is not really this prime land for agriculture or anything like that so we need as much wisdom as we possibly can have from Palestinian farmers, we learn about rain-fed agriculture and drought-tolerant seeds. Wow. Like these are the, the the lessons that we could be sharing with each other. That that global commons, like as we're building the commons in the material world where we exist, I think just strategically, uh, just a geographic formation for this to be. Uh, resilient because it's it, everything is so tiny and t how can the how can the small how can the tiny 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 be resilient by leaning into that inter interconnectivity yes by weaving yeah. them, right so yeah. like if our seed, if we lose our seeds in a fire here we hopefully have created other we have hopefully shared seeds with other locations right other land bases 
so that the seeds themselves don't get destroyed. So th mm. this thinking geographically, I think it's really important. Like what is the geography for this prefigured, these, these prefigured world? Yes. Because we're used to thinking of politics as the nation state yes. container, as the municipal yes. level container. Yes. Municipalism does, right? And a lesson that was at once full of horror and full of hope, <laughs> um, like how the compas in France don't have a justice, they have land, but they don't have justice. Like we could do that now. Another one at the Zapatista Little School was being in a village that had been 100% Zapatista in 1994. And then like by now, like half of it left the organization. They're not anti-Zapatistas, they're just not Zapatistas. And to be Zapatista means that you need to uh, serve in the government and learn the government and make decisions. It's, it's a very, like, it's work to be free, which is another reason why maybe some people don't, I've no, I, found, I have met people who do not want to be free. They want to be told what to do. They want someone to tell them what to do and give them everything. So there's also that um, in terms of this. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, you know, I'm a piece of me, the, the Leninists, <laughs> the Stalinists, the Trotskyists. <laughs> Just say, yeah, no, we want to have our party's apparatus and the party boss that will, who's such a genius that yeah. will dictate down to us how we get free, you know? That's the, that's the huge difference is that there is, I mean, we're talking about, about convincing a lot of the above just doesn't believe in the below, doesn't believe in the people and people's capacities. Yeah. yeah. So in, in that village, when I realized that not the whole village was Zapatista, and even within households, there were some who were Zapatistas and some who were not Zapatistas, I was like, whoa, like it was like a geographic, uh, uh, cognitive dissonance, <laughs> geographic dissonance. Um, because I had thought that Zapatista territory was homogenous, and it's not, it's networked. It's yes. You know, within at the health, within the person level to the family level to you know, it's all networked, and that mm -hmm. gives hope for our context, wherever it is that we are, like in the city, for example, where and and beyond, where we're already organizing in this networked way. We really just what what we really need is a material basis to sustain our everyday existence, sustenance to get past this storm in the material mm -hmm. world. We have it here in you know, in communications. Also, the spiritual and psychological question I think is important with capitalism being the <laughs> brutally materialist. I love how you said that. Brutally materialist. And there's still a spirituality. It's following a spirituality of empire. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And this is what we miss when we want to talk only about the secular in struggle right 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 it it yes the the spirituality of, of empire versus you know the way that someone like gustavo gutierrez would say like like a spirituality of solidarity mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and yeah I, I i love everything that you said there and i love the the ecological part of, of what of what you were saying there and i wanted i wanted to ask you you know like your thoughts around like ecological collapse and authoritarianism because you know as you're speaking about the wisdom of migrants and zapatista people and their understandings of of the land it it it, it makes me think of what's happening in the amazon right now and the indigenous people there are struggling to keep one of our most important forced uh, around that literally will affect the quality of air and oxygen that we need <laughs> you know that's just being cut down that's just being destroyed and i wanted to ask you like yeah connecting those intersections between like authority like the surging global movements authoritarian and fascist movements with the ecological because uh you you know, there's been more reporting coming out in terms of Israel's war on Palestine and how that is producing so much um, emissions, greenhouse 
gas is being released into the atmosphere, which is accelerating yep. this, this this climate chaos, right? And and the amount of destruction that these regimes and these empires are capable of within the span of a few days or a few months, to where like they're releasing the same amount of emissions within a few months that some countries release annually, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, connecting, you know, populist authoritarian movements and governmental authoritarian movements with like an acceleration of climate catastrophe. You know, I, I, I wanted your, I wanted your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Accelerating climate catastrophe. And in fact, I mean, someone in the chat had put, had talked about the end of a, his end of history thesis, which was, which was the conversation in the nineties with globalization that, with the Soviet Union having lost to NATO, to capital, that it was just the end of history now. Like there's no more history after that. There's no more calendar after that. Like once everyone can emulate the European man, then everyone, that's just, that, that is what the end aspiration is. There is something about the spirituality of empire and in particular Christendom that has been apocalyptic since the beginning <laughs> and where like Christopher Columbus himself was convinced that the world was going to end in 155 years. Like when he came this way, he was coming for Jerusalem. So it wasn't just the material. It was, it was this holy unholy war that had been raging even before they came to us over here. And so there's pe people who are actively Empire subjects, many of the empire subjects who subscribe to this calendar, they're actively trying to make the end of the world happen in their lifetime. And they don't care. I remember George W. Bush, who was very evangelical, apocalyptic, apocalyptic uh, holy war. Uh, he called it a crusade. And in in, in right after 9-11, what, what he was going to go do to the Middle East. And then his people were like, don't be calling it a crusade <laughs> in public. <laughs> You're right. You know, You're right. <laughs> and he himself, like he has like every everything that he was doing to me, the only way that it made sense is if you understand that he believes that the end of the world is nigh and people want to see it in their lifetime. They want to help guy out. This is also a tension within the Zionist movement and Judaism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zionist movement is trying to make this come about. And so they're with climate collapse with ecological collapse there is that part there are people who don't see a future because they believe that you know heaven is coming right. and a lot of them sadly are leading another is people who really believe understand the dangers of what's happening with the planet with complex life forms on the planet and they believe that it's overpopulation. That's the problem. And this is again, the problem of not critiquing lifestyle, instead wanting to keep this overconsumptive lifestyle and then saying, there's just not enough for everybody. We got to get rid of the chaff and the chaff is us. Yeah. <laughs> the chaff is everybody. And that's, that's how like when I see Palestine right now and, and, what, and Israel's display of genocide to the world, it's displaying how it can take care of surplus populations, which has been the problem of capital in particular since automation forward. Whereas like the worker, which is largely the white worker, didn't really see the uh, experience, the apocalypse that our peoples have experienced because they were protected as they were needed as workers. And then, but then when the factories leave, they go to China or Mexico or, or when automation hits, then they're no longer as protected as before. So they're falling to the below with us. And this fascist movement that we're seeing with Trump, to me, that, that, that's what that is. It's a lot of people who could also have been neutralized by Bernie because Bernie was also talking about bringing back jobs in the economy. But with eco-fascism, what we see is a fascist, understand, a fascist response to climate collapse, which is, Sa having the world or saving the world for the existence of some and getting rid of the others, which is largely coming from Europe, unsurprising, sadly. And so this question then becomes of surplus populations. And just concretely, I started hearing this 
really come into force over the last decade. Here, uh, I went to a community college presentation a few years back. It was just on, on climate change and it had several speakers from the community. And there was a woman in the community who gave a presentation and she said that she likes this website a lot. We should follow the website. I can't remember the name. Um, and she, start, she put up a photo of, of kids, brown kids, and called it overpopulation. That the problem is overpopulation. And I go to the website and that photograph is of Gaza. Wow. Just brown kids understood as a problem as too many you know this is this is what we're facing this is a reality that we're that we're facing for for those who are talking seriously about the dangers of climate collapse we have to talk about something way bigger and how is it that we're going to relate to each other through, through this storm how are we not going to make it all just a fucking bar fight all over all around us hell like octavia butler's novels right just yes. fires yes. everywhere right that is that is that is actually a really great response that you gave how can we convince people that it's not always going to be this way like all comfort read octavia butler yes you know? very 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 prophetic book <laughs> very um and i and i love what you said there you know and kind of to speak to this this idea of apocalypse and speaking as a um a sometimes reluctant christian myself <laughs> you know this notion of apocalypse i hate the way it has been understood in 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 our culture right and people sort of desires for apocalypse like why it's it's in all of the media you know, everyone loves Walking Dead, your favorite video games are post-apocalyptic, you know, Cormac McCarthy, The Road, and all this other stuff. And there's so many really toxic and incorrect understandings of time and human nature that inform a lot of that sort of broken desire for apocalypse. But rather, truly understanding apocalypse as what it is, is, is a revealing of what it has, has been hidden previously mm -hmm. and, and also understanding apocalypse is not this one event that's another toxic understanding that apocalypse is the big event no 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 apocalypse is a reoccurring phenomenon through our human life so we're not we're not, not talking about this sort of like like COVID-19 apocalypse that was apocalyptic right, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an apocalypse. But when you look at human history, that is not the first time that human beings have dealt with massive contagions. This isn't the first time that human beings have dealt with br brutal armed conflicts and warfare. This isn't the first time that we've dealt with climate disaster. And we're, but, but we've been through these things before. Now, obviously, things are very different now. We've been through these things before, but we remain. Okay, we remain. So what lessons do our ancestors all over the world have for us that we, we can that we can internalize so that we can remain, right? But apocalypse is a reoccurring thing. There and, and apocalypse is not just this sort of big political and social event. There are apocalypses in our lives that ends one chapter of our lives and 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 shifts us over to the next something has been revealed the veil has been dropped right so what apocalypse it's about what apocalypse do we do do, do people want right and you're talking about the sort of authoritarian or zionist or eco-fascist apocalypses which is a which is undergirded by a deep hatred of life in existence. They'll say otherwise. They'll claim to be pro-life, you know, they'll claim, no, you know, the, 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 the lies and the masks of conservatism. They'll claim to love life. They'll claim to be doing this for life, for existence, but it, it, it hates life. It hates existence. And that's what makes it truly evil. You know, understanding evil as a sort of unmaking, a sort of uncreating, 
right? They they really hate life. Absolutely. It's a very Which is why they want to escape. These are mechanisms of escape. That's what Eric Fromm calls mechanisms of escape. They want they want out of this. No, no, I want this heaven that I imagine. I want out. Sorry to cut you off. No, I mean it makes sense when I'm writing a, this, the Palestine 1492 book has Europe as a character. <laughs> um, and that, that character, it just as a, as a, as a discursive tool, but Europe as a character that, I mean, ha, is so focused on the end of this world. And it makes sense to me if the world is as fucked up as it has been in Europe, even since before they came over mm -hmm. here, how they were in other, you know, and slave slavery and then feudalism, which is a different kind of slavery, you know, and again, not, not to homogenize Europe because there's a Europe from below, which is why Europe has right. a, a character, the features that it's that it says that it has. <laughs> um, and so there has been um, a, a quite unhealthy understanding of death, too, where, yes. you know, in, like death and life do not go side by side in modernity. They're also above below. So life is above and death is below and only yeah. some worthy of life and others are worthy more of death, you know? And so like when, when, when we have a loss of a loved one or of a world, like we don't really have in this society rituals of grief. Mm -hmm. Like the, the way mm -hmm. that you're talking about apocalypse is so helpful, I think, in many ways of life and, and the way that you understand Christianity, not as this literal <laughs> construction, yeah. that like that is so basic, like you're engaging with it at the metaphysical, symbolic yeah. level, the, the level of feeling, which is the more liberatory ways that I think we all relate to our worlds, is right. what can this lesson from the ancestors help me with for my context right now, which right. is different, doesn't have to be literal. And so the way that you're talking about apocalypse in this way that can be helpful for life is recognizing loss as loss, like as the deep loss that it is, and it can be worlds, just like a lot of people right now are feeling an apocalypse in their social relations, in their family relations, in their workplace relations, on this question of genocide. Yeah. That's assume they would never have to confront as a contradiction yeah and that is a loss and it and we need to learn to or be okay with right and it, it have these practices of grief yeah. we need to do this grief work and especially when it comes to something such as the extinction of species the, the six mass yeah. extinction that we're doing, right we listen to climate scientists talk about how depressed they are. They, they didn't get into marine biology 30 years ago because yeah. they thought they were going to witness extinction. They went to celebrate it, celebrate life under the sea. And then there they're seeing the coral reefs dying out. And then before their eyes, in, in just one year, the, the drastic changes and how they fall into depression and the ways that they try to navigate that is by recognizing that we need to grieve and we need to do collective grieving on this question. It's not just a personal loss. Yes. yes. And, and, that, and that kind of speaks to some of the issues in the church as well, where it's like a lot of this sort of American Western practices of Christianity are rooted in a deeply triumph this triumphalist, yeah. right? We, we overcame, we won. God is going to bring us da 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 da. But in the Bible, there's the book of Lamentations, which is a book that is coming really from the perspective of the, the most vulnerable and the most weak, the sick, the elderly, women, children. Because that was all that was left in, in, in Israel when the men were all taken away, right? They thought that was that's an apocalyptic. The book of Lamentations is it's rooted in grief, it's grief and mourning and questioning. But it's also apocalyptic. This is the end of our world, yeah. right? And it's about okay. Even our understandings of apoc our apocalyptic notions are rooted in that frame of above and below. You know. Mm -hmm. So what apocalypse is? Apocalyptic notions are we going to internalize? You know, I want to internalize the the, the apocalyptic notions of a John Brown, right? Hey. The end. The ending of the institution of slavery. Abolition versus 
the apocalypse of of a Mark Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> right. Who was who was bought up? But some someone someone mentioned bunkers in here. Who was bought up a bunch of the destroyed land in Hawaii to build bunkers, right? These are making it. These people want to escape. Yeah. They want to get out. They have no love for this world, this home that we have here. Yeah. And I think you know one of the critiques that people level at Christianity is that it often has a sort of linear understanding of time but what i would say is that in christianity there is a sort of counter to the sort of seasonal cyclical understanding but it's there is a cycle but it's rooted in relationship meaning that this a proper understanding of christianity is this human beings being home and being in community union with home with god whatever it may be and then they're they're lost they 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 leave home or they're forced out of home and so the pro process is us going back to home right it's not rooted in the seasons it's not really rooted in the earth like that but it's rooted in a return to home it's 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 a social thing is a is a relational thing and part of it it is land as well but it, it's it's yeah it's a cycle of you know home coming right uh -huh. a lot of these people a lot of these authoritarians they don't want to they don't want to go home they've internalized they're they're, they're consuming they're accumulating i mean they're talking about Linda, they're talking about going to the fucking moon. They're talking about build, they're talking about going to the moon. People can't even keep their fucking cigarette butts off of the ground, off of the street, and you want to colonize space? I mean, it's it it's the can we talk about priorities? <laughs> can we talk about priorities? They don't want to go home. That and that's what's frightening for me is like we were home. We're we're in this place of being lost and we're trying to get back home, but there are people who do not want us to get back home and they're putting up roadblocks, they're lying to us, they're deceiving us so that we don't get to go back home, so that we don't get to to have healthy communion again, so that we aren't in right relationship anymore. You know, it's, 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 it's absurd. It's absurd. And uh, there's a comment here um, from I Ponder. Yeah, apoc apocalypse literature and media from settler colonialists is incredibly revealing, can be very racist or seems to be coming from guilt and shame, and also seems to be coming from a defeatist suicidal mentality. That's what we're talking, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the leaders of the world, the authoritarians of the world, the fascists of the world, whatever it may be, trying to, to, to lock us in these processes and in these ways of living and being that are effectively driving us towards a sort of global murder suicide that's what this is and so it's like okay you know how do we how do we get away from the ledge <laughs> you know like how do how do we do that mm -hmm. you know like well, we have the theory and we have all of, all of that, the discursive stuff, like you said, but we need the practical material stuff and to move on it now as soon as possible. That's right. Yeah, I, the, the, the best thing to do is just start with whatever it is, even if it's a tiny little seed, like literal seed, like learning just to grow something, right? Or if we have more access to a, a, a material base but we need to start with these new social relationships now and it's in that practice where we develop our theory because theory theory is just trying to explain why all these things keep these patterns keep on appearing over and over and over and over i have a theory for this you know and it takes understanding that we're all intelligent every single one of us is intelligent we can figure this out together and i think a healthy way for us to relate to this space is social media and i've just been thinking about it a lot because i've been off of social media for almost a decade it's felt really great but now a lot of us have to come up on social media 
to 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 fight in this discursive battle and it's not right. a discursive battle it is a lack of critical thinking yeah. that i'm seeing right like we're not treated those talking to us on these platforms aren't treating us as if we're intelligent thinkers like you know we're getting a lot of propaganda back even from folks that we trust and we love rather yeah. than an i don't know what do you think or what do we all think like for example the icj decision there's a huge split from and not this isn't an easy split but from the ground palestinians on the ground and palestinians who are trained in international law like the split in terms of what this what this means that the icj didn't call for a genocide explicitly but then yeah. others are, oh, yeah well they kind of did you know like right what how do we relate to these institutions, empires, institutions at this tactical level? Mm -hmm. What do we pull out of it, right? What wins can we pull out of it while also recognizing that there are losses as well? Yes. You know, and so if we can't have conversations like that as a community here, we need to, we need to just start doing them then because it's going to be us who sets the tone, the ground, organize people, right? Rather than those who aren't really i don't know if they're doing organizing or not at the ground material level yeah um, but if we can put all of our talents and our perspectives together in this way like why not create and in a dual power kind of sense a body some kind of body some kind of formation of global accountability where we ourselves say what the fuck a genocide is and what it you know rather than being yeah. told, rather than we don't need your fucking an institution to to describe for us and declare for us what we are seeing with our own eyes and what the people experiencing it on the ground are telling you that telling us that it is we don't need your fucking european court for that no we say it's fucking genocide and we say it needs to stop and we are going to end it absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely why don't we organize that you know or and it'll take a lot of different talents a lot of different but instead of trying to keep us in the burning house, international <laughs> law is a tool that keeps afloat empire. And since the United Nations was created, it is a very deceptive tool in that it has allowed some of the below to come above to make it seem as if that line doesn't exist anymore of above. Mm -hmm. And in particular, yeah. and Zionism, this is its masterful move of redemption is that it makes the Holocaust, the Nazi Holocaust, the worst crime in the history of humanity, according to empire. <laughs> of course, you know, not talking about anything that happened to our ancestors and our people and it's happening to us. At all. At all. And so it creates this story that the Nazi Holocaust is the worst thing in the history of humanity. And then it becomes its own savior of that by saving Israel or backing up Israel. Yes. And so then it allows... Yes. <laughs> that move allows empire to use our own arguments against us that this shit is racist, that this shit is genocide. Instead, they deflect it by using Zionism, the figure of the Holocaust, to throw back at us as if we're the racist now. So this, right. this has to be undone. This was with decolonization, which really was not decolonization. It was just changing the faces uh running the plantations called nation yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a more yeah. way <laughs> yes where, it, where it's now like how are we going to resist it's our own people now we've been talking shit about europe all this time and now it's us <laughs> so yeah. this has to be critiqued at the fullest level if we're going to really create something different but if we don't have that critique if we're just talking about the the winds and the winds of international law or the losses of international law without seeing okay tactically what does that mean for our bigger strategy of dual power because we can't have a tactical engagement unless we have an outside strategy unless we have another house we're building where the floors above are not crushing the floors below All right how do we how do we use the master's tools to build that other house but not preserve that house, not replicate that house. And yeah. that's, that's, that's what 
we need to do at the level of assembly of collective like learn to strategize as a collective body mm -hmm. whether whatever mm -hmm. community formation looks like and then anyone tasked to engage in these tactical maneuvers is already guided on that return home right this it's yeah. that guided path right because we're veering away in trying to in, in building dual power we're going to always be confronted with how do we strengthen the new how do we use these tools to strengthen the new while we're going in this space this bourgeois space that's a soul crusher for a lot of us how do we stay into uh, integral and not be used how do we use the tools and not have ourselves be used as the tools to keep reinforcing the same shit right right and yeah it's, it's about like how do we get out of this sort of like orwellian system that we're in where it's like the powers that be well well we describe reality for you and here you just regurgitate our descriptions of reality that we have made for you right that that's that you know paulo Freire touches on that too right like the oppressors they that's what they do they have the, that discursive power and i you're touching on so much of just like you know issues to me of like internalized oppression you know with bringing those uh from below above right and and those individuals really believing that they could actually make change for their people for their communities through these very same systems that are actively destroying their people in their communities everything right that deep internalized oppression you know right i mean this is what we learn in schools this is what schools tell us we're supposed to be doing this is what the media tells us right. we're supposed to be doing, right so this actually, this is if someone asked at a workshop we had um, last weekend, like, what are what are some effective ways to convince others? So just getting back to this question of convincing. And I love right now what you what you highlighted. A lot of folks who are going above genuinely think this is helpful, that this is the yes. way. They're not assholes. They're not evil. They're, they're it can be all of us, any of us, you know, yes. given that opportunity. If that's how we're taught, that's what makes change. And if, if that's, and if we're taught that another way makes change, then I think that that can help. If we can show that there's a structure of above and below, and it looks like the cops, the courts, the teacher, the landlord, the, you know, that's the structure. And those below actually have an easier time seeing structure because we hit up on structure a lot more than those above mm -hmm. where structure is, is kind of made so that all obstacles are out of the way. We're the obstacles. <laughs> and, you know, and here I'm not always talking about me as below always, like it's contextual, like vis-a-vis -vis Europe, Native Americans, Africans, we're below. But vis-a-vis -vis a context of um, higher education, that I have a higher education degree, like that places me above. Right? Right. And it's not a position that I like but it's a position that is a reality according to this discourse, this discursive move that we're taught. So if we can talk more about structure and see that we're positioned in this, like in, we're set up to hurt each other and to hurt ourselves, then that can take away what I've experienced, some of the defensiveness that we might have with difficult conversations, because we've been taught that everything is about individual choice, action, morality. That if you're racist, mm -hmm. that's because you're a bad individual rather than individual. the structure that created you. Yeah, racist, you've been or that. socialized and conditioned through the systems and its logics to be that's right. that. Yeah, that, right. absolutely. And I, I think what you're articulating is like, we need to have serious, networks and mass organizational bodies that center counter hegemonic political education for the people so that they can un so that people already have an understanding of what's happening to them but when you put when you give them or we we whole learn if you will pedagogy of the Pressed, right that opens up like they'll understand oh this is this is what's happening this is what i'm in yeah. right and so we, we need those sort of organizational bodies 
but it also has to be internationalist. It has to be intercommunalist, mm -hmm. right? We need this all over the world because again, you know, once we have that serious political education and, and the people and we ourselves have as co-learners and co-teachers have developed these, our own um, discursive tools from below. And it's, it's this it's these it's these communities a, a real international community mm -hmm. right not the bullshit western global north international community everyone's but a true international community that has our own discursive tools that way when these bodies like the icj try to tell us that what it is what reality is we already have our own system of like no no this is actually what reality is that's right and you've seen examples of this you saw this with with, with people becoming citizen scientists in regards of covid and all of the, the 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 disinformation and misinformation there people becoming um citizen scientists when it came to flint michigan and the water crisis there um you see it on internationally in japan where after the fukushima um i believe the the radioactive um, sort of like not meltdown, but like it was. I believe it was uh, battered by tsunamis. And don't quote me on this. My my history is kind of fuzzy on it. But what I do remember is that it was it was women in 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 these Japanese communities, mothers in these Japanese communities, monitoring monitoring by caring for their own families. What was what was going on with the quality of what, what's happening with their food? What's happening with their produce? Mm -hmm. Developing ways independently to test, right, the chemicals and the, and the food and and everything like that 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 them and their children were going to be consuming, right? Mm -hmm. That it's that we already have that. We don't, those are just a, a few historical examples. We already have that. How do we make these broader, again, broader organizational bodies internationally to where people can start doing this for ourselves, testing our own water, testing our own food, so on and so forth. Again, centering responsibility, centering uh, self-sustainability, centering self-governance, right? So, yeah. That's it. Yeah. I love this so much. We've been here for two hours and <laughs> keep going so much longer but maybe we can do this again i don't know how y'all feel in the chat i how do you feel about this format demetrius in this conversation maybe for the future again i love i love it yeah let's let's do it again for sure it's been so good but thanks everyone who's joining who's joined us and who is in the chat and i just want to see this the last yeah isra you comment the other side of visualizing apocalypse in this way it also shifts the way we look at revolution mm -hmm. it is al it also is not a big event thing but rather in the way we live our day-to-day -day life yes that's a really yes nice way to, to right. end there yeah, i'm seeing folks loving it so thank, thank you all so much for for um joining you know i'm not i know folks probably don't know me as much as they know kiki i'm i'm no scholar or, or expert i don't have a degree or any of these other things i'm just you know like everyone else i'm a neighbor i'm a concerned neighbor who wants myself and my other neighbors to be free and so you know i'm willing to do the work to study to learn and to practice so that we can get free and and yeah thank y'all for Thank you, Kiki, for this and willing to do this. Thank you to everyone watching. So, yeah. We'll do it again and soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I love you again. Thank you, Thank you so much. Y'all take care. Have a good one.